have a word of the Lord I've been ruminating on for a couple of months that I wanted to share. It really, for me, it's uh, like a word picture that the Lord's given me to help kind of synthesize a lot of the words that we've been given, um, especially around identity, about one life, um, and also about receiving. So, um, so back in December during prayer week, I think the, um, Jordan had encouraged us to uh, ask the Lord what we should be praying for one another. So I was doing that that week, and the Lord told me, um, he says, I want to give you a gift. I said, okay. And then I thought, you know, in my brain, you know, when somebody says, I want to give you a gift, we naturally kind of know what that means. It's like there's going to be a present uh, or something like that. Um, but I know I've been walking with the Lord long enough that when he says, I want to give you a gift, I may have no clue what he's about actually to say or to give me. So I just, I waited anxiously. So um, after that, uh, the Lord then said the following. He said, I want to give you uh, the gift of losing your life so you can have my life. So when I first heard this, I thought, well, yes, of course, the Lord has given us his life so that we can have his life. It's almost like I started to think about it too um, pragmatically, like it was a statement of, of fact or truth. And like the Lord says, you know, um, he so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Like, yes, I believe that. That's, um, I want that. But then he kept emphasizing the word gift. And I'm like, going, why, why are you emphasizing the word gift? Um, so I kept, I kept ruminating on it and asking the Lord about it. Um, I didn't understand, but the more I thought of it as a fact, like the gospel or the good news of the gospel, that I can take this as fact or even a statement of faith, or even believe that this is true, but God said he wanted to give me a gift. So what is about a gift that was unique or different? One thing that was impressed upon me is that the Lord, in, in giving this, it's almost like I had a mental picture of him. He was so um, uh, delighted and anxious, like, like, he wanted to give this so much, like, just with anticipation, like, I want to give this to you. Like, that was very, very clear. Um, the other thing, I was also reminded of a word many years ago that Gerilyn gave about, um, about that really costly shirt that the Lord told her, you know, buy it, buy it. Like, the Holy Spirit kept whispering, buy it. And it seemed too expensive, it seemed too lavish, but it was like, no, just do it. It's the same kind of thing. The Lord's like, open it, open it. Um, so a gift, so I was, when I started to think, like, well, so what is it about a gift, Lord? And he's like, the gift, a gift has to be opened. If you put a gift under the tree or on a table for someone and they never open it, what good is it? So that he was starting to teach me about receiving. So a gift has to be opened and it also has to be used. So like, you know, a great sweater from your grandma, if it sits in your closet, you're never really receiving that gift because you're just putting it away. So that was two things that the Lord was um, showing me. Um, then I got one more picture. Uh, it's like it's like what the really the gift was was actually like a robe that I was to put on, and this robe um, it's only like in Galatians three twenty seven uh, that we we clothe ourselves with Christ. It's almost like the Lord said, "My gift is that." You can have my life, like you can wear it. Um, so I, I call this garment my garment of praise. And in him, there's fullness of joy. And it's actually the garment of my salvation. And it's not just something I wear, but it's actually identity itself. I was also reminded... Uh, a passage that's meant a lot to me in Zechariah 3, where Joshua the priest was taken by the angels, and they took off his filthy garments, um, and instead they gave him a, a festal robe, so it was clean and white, and they gave him a new turban, and he said, if you walk in my ways, um, I'm paraphrasing, but basically, if you keep the ways of the Lord, you'll have access to the heavenly realms, to these people who are here with you, the angels. So it's kind of like, if you 
Um, clothing and identifying ourselves, receiving the gift of God is like putting ourselves basically in a new kingdom, in a new heavenly city. Um, so God's gift allows us to be like him, a son of God, access to the throne of God, seated high in the heavenly places. I'm not deficient in one thing. Not one thing has been withheld. So then somewhere in the last couple of months in this conversation with the Lord, I asked him, but what about when I act or live from my old identity? So the, these two people, you know, it's before the gift and after the gift. So I was asking the Lord, because um, I'm aware sometimes I'm not, you know, I'm not always behaving the way I truly am. So it's like, um, I, I asked the Lord, well, what about this? And, um, and it's almost like in my mind, or I kind of get a little whiny uh, with the Lord. And it's like, I want to, it's familiar maybe. Uh, it's maybe a better way to say it. It's like, but Lord, you don't know how long I've been dealing with this issue. You know, this is the old man talking. But Lord, you don't know what was spoken over me and how it's hard for me to receive love. And I, you know, I have all these excuses in my head. And, um, and the Lord just says softly, softly, it's like, it's okay. It's okay. I understand. Like, he knows everything. And um, he says, but I want to give you a gift. So I can be here. I could stay here. I could do that. But the Lord wants to give us the gift. So it's about receiving the gift and, and wearing and identifying the gift. Um, it's like Graham Cook explains uh, when the Lord... I think it was the Lord who told him once that uh, you can't have back your old stuff, the stuff that I died that I died for. So once I came in the cross and what I did for you, you can't have that back anymore. So you don't have a right to go back. So it's like the Lord really just like see yourself over here, you know. Um, and then for me, this is where I have to war. So this ties in maybe with what we talked about last week. So I repent and I return to the truth. I repent and I return to the truth. And I'll even sometimes get a mental picture of myself um, in my head and have to tell myself, remember who you are, uh, remember what he's done, remember what he has given. And even better, what I think was a couple weeks ago that we talked about, even more than me getting a mental picture of myself, fix your eyes on the Lord himself and let him speak to you about who you are, let him speak to you about who, you know, who he's made you to be. So as a personal example of this, another day when I was in prayer, the Lord was reminding me about this word and the gift and I actually found myself saying these words to the Lord, and I couldn't believe it at first, but I said, um, I said, well, you kind of had to do that, you know. You had to give yourself up for me, for the world, because you're God. You're the Savior. That's, that's what you do. That's who you are. <laughs> and, uh, and I had to stop myself. I'm like, oh, my gosh. It's like, that is totally an old man thought. Like, <laughs> that is not, you know, there's not any, uh, I'm not really honoring him by, you know, having that mindset. And, uh, I actually found out that, as I started to think about it, it's really an issue of pride, and not pride maybe the way we typically think about it, where it's like arrogant, and I got this covered, and I got this, but it's actually more an issue of like worthlessness, which is just as prideful as arrogance, because, because it still focuses on the self. So the, the thing about the old man, and the thing that I always know uh, when I'm not really wearing my identity is it will all be about me. It'll be about how I feel, um, how am I perceiving this, what's going on with me. And so, again, the Lord's like, it's okay, it's all right, I know, but I want you to receive this gift. And the genius of this word, actually, for me, is my family can uh, attest, I don't receive gifts very well. I'm, I'm very hard to buy for, and not just because I'm a typical guy. It's like, what do we get them, socks? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's more, it's more uh, out of a root of kind of like, uh, I'm not worth it, don't bother that kind of thing. So again, it's, it's a wrong perspective. It's an old man perspective. So the genius of this word for me was like the, the God says, no, I want to give you a gift. And the gift is actually himself. And he's like, and I want you to wear it. I want you to, and that really honors him um, to wear it, not just to leave it in the closet, not just to, but so receiving has something to do with just wearing what the Lord has given us. And it is a precious, precious gift. And for me, it was just a good word picture that I can kind of remind myself of and, and keep it for him. So. We're going to look at the temptation between Jesus and Satan. And I want to draw out some things, and I'm just going to be relatively brief today because of time. And there's a lot there. But let me explain 
That's why I also gave, uh, gave notes today. I, I want to kind of I want to help you understand why I'm doing this first, instead of trying to find out at the end of the sermon. I want you to be able to track with me, so that you can listen to the sermon and sermons based on this in a way that's easier for you to receive if you know where I'm going. So that's why. The first thing is, in our culture, in the American or Western culture, it's really hard for Christians to get this, this mindset that they are in warfare, that they are called to a really high calling, which is no less than to represent the Father on the earth. That's just, it's amazing. So I understand why this is hard for people to conceive of. That probably seems so abstract and also so great. It's hard for us to know how to receive that, but that's true. I find that many Christians have a difficulty with zeal, with a level of engagement, uh, because the Christian life seems rather static. It's not really something where there is an engagement with God at a high level that would so motivate them that they would move against anything that would dare keep them planted in the same place. And I think it's because of a mindset. Oh, I'm sure that it is. So in the temptation account, which I'll read in a moment, it's quite amazing what this is, what we're looking at here. So what you're looking at is the Son of God against the archangel, the fallen archangel, Lucifer, now, now just known as the adversary, Satan. That's what it means. He's just against whatever God is for. So it's kind of odd, really, isn't it? I mean, you have a meeting with the devil and Jesus. Did they have to have this meeting? If they had the meeting, did we have to know about the meeting? It's kind of, kind of pretty amazing that you just get this slice out of ultimate reality here where you have the devil and you have Jesus of Nazareth. And there's a conversation. Actually, in Luke, it's clear that these weren't the only temptations. There was numbers of temptations. We don't know where these fell, but it seems like these were kind of the end of all the series of temptations, what we read here. <clears throat> when you look at this account, the first thing you have to ask is, so why do we see this? And it really isn't what you might think, or at least it wasn't what I thought, which is, it's good to know about Jesus and this encounter is enlightening because, you know, he's my savior. But really... That's true, but fundamentally, it is a lesson for his disciples. How do you deal with the devil? And what's really clear is you don't get a choice whether you will deal with him or not. Many people might say, well, I'd be scared if I had to confront Satan that way. But the reality, brothers and sisters, is this, is that you are in confrontation with him. You may not see it this way, but you are in a confrontation with him. What the, uh, we have to realize is that the dynamic that we see here is, is our dynamic. The reason we don't see it is because Satan is the deceiver in one part. Well, in Galatians, Jesus, excuse me, Paul says that Satan is, can disguise himself as an angel of light. He can disguise himself as an angel of light. He can also just sit in darkness and you not be aware of what he's doing. But what he's doing is he's working on people's hearts to freeze them, to shrink them, so that their world is themselves. Because once... We live primarily for ourselves. He's got us because that's his domain. And we've got to be clear about this. When you look at, look at this count in a moment, the way the universe and the spiritual world is divided up is this way. There's a kingdom of darkness of which 
Satan has a rulership. And then there's a kingdom of God where Jesus and his Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God, where his government is expressed. And then this is the kingdom of darkness where Satan's government is expressed and experienced. Now here's why Christians aren't activated. They think, yes, but there's this slice in the middle that I can choose to live in. I mean, hey, I don't have to be fully under the domain of Satan, and I don't really have to fully be under the reign of Jesus, because that's not my experience. I don't see that. I see that there's this, I mean, rather, you know, to be honest, by way of experience, many Christians would say, the larger area is the in-between area right here, and then here's, you know, the kingdom of God, and, and here's Satan. This is his flames. <laughs> so, but really, most people and most Christians live in there. That's a total lie. There is not any demarcation. In fact, you see, even if I was to do this, okay, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan, darkness, light, you can't even put, there's not even room for a line. Totally are meeting each other all the time. I mean, why this meeting? Because what's at issue is who are you going to live for? What is real life? Who is going to be the king on the earth? Who gets the people on the earth? But we somehow think we're not involved in this discussion, and that would be a deceit. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Well, then, see, some people would say, I'd say, maybe I'd say to someone, okay, are you ready to meet Satan today? Because you're going to have an encounter with him. Are you ready? He said, well, no, no, I'm not ready for that. Well, then that means you lose. Right. Do you think that's true? Yes. How do you know the losers? Cold heart, dull to the spirit. They are not zealous about the things of God. Their, their love for others is very, very weak. They are not rooted in the kingdom of God, but primarily they live to, for what's around them on this earth. Their life is situated around their job, around a dream or an ambition. And somebody might say, what's wrong with that? There's only two kingdoms, and there's only one Lord that we can choose. I'm going to make it really clear. I believe the scriptures are really clear in this account. There's everything wrong with that. Because... At the very end of the temptation in Luke, we're going to read the whole thing, but I want to kind of skip down to the end here right now. <clears throat> okay, Luke 4, 1, 4, 8. See that in bold? Final temptation is answered with, it is written, you shall worship the Lord and serve him. No, and serve him only. That's the big thing. Not just serve him, but serve him only. And people who would be in a confrontation with Satan and would have an expectancy of their victory have to know in their heart of heart that they're serving him only. Now, let's be clear here for a moment because sometimes this is vague to us because the English doesn't help us understand that where it says that you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only, the word for worship and the word for service is very much the same word. So we just think worship is what we do together when we're singing or praying and, well, hey, I'm a good worshiper, but I'm not a very good server. I'm not really giving my whole life to him. 
but I, I can sing, I can worship, I shout out loud, raise my hands. So we kind of make this distinction in our head that doesn't exist. You can't truly be worshiping God in spirit and truth unless the whole life is centered around, rooted in allegiance and loyalty to God alone. Alone. Only. Allegiance to him not shared with anything or anyone else. Satan works in the areas where we're unclear and we ourselves have not made that resolve so clear to us that we kind of wonder, is it really serve him only? Now the Lord again is teaching his disciples. That's why he's recounting this experience with the evil one. He's teaching them how to deal with the enemy and make sure he goes away. You have to have some things in place and really the test. This is the warfare. It is our heart. Or if this helps by way of poetry, our heart of hearts, the very, very core of who we are. And how do you really know who you are? You just ask people who watch you. You just listen to your own speech. You just pay attention to what you sacrifice for. Where do you give your money, your time? Where is the chunk of emotional energy that we express? Now, brothers and sisters, I, this is actually a sermon of encouragement. Now, see, I know at points you might think, gee, I wonder where I'm at here. Well, that's why the Lord wants to help us be clear. So that your own heart did not, does not accuse you. But one of the things that can help us is because the culture is insipid, is tempid, lukewarm. Because Christianity typically in America is not known by a high level of sustained zeal that's filled with love and expresses love, but primarily church-going or moments of enthusiasm that we can get confused if we try to learn by studying our environment rather than looking at our master and how he dealt with the prince and power of the year. That's what Paul calls it the ruler of this age. He's still ruling, but there's a way that he cannot rule over those who are, who have a heart and a disposition where they know in their heart of heart that they worship and serve the Lord only. And I'm telling you, is an encouragement Everyone can know that they are worshiping and serving the Lord only. And if you're thinking, well, that means that you can't mess up, that's not true. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the disposition, the orientation of where you want to go and where you are going. Your GPS, it's already marked ahead of time, kingdom of God. It's not constantly changing. You may make a wrong turn, but you're still decided and clear-headed. And you have enough evidences for yourself and for others to observe that you know that you are all about worshiping and serving the Lord only. And I'm telling you, I'm going to just say one thing today. There's so much to say. I'm just going to say one thing today about how you can know that. And that is that you are there in the desert, that is not an expression of a 
dark time, that means you are on the battlefield, that you're in a place where you are there to confront Satan. Right now you know how you're confronting Satan, and right now you know how you're winning. See, if you don't even know with the engagement, then it means you're not winning. You're already kind of checked out, and you know Satan can work with that. But he can't work with a disciple that is fixed on being just like his or her master and who seeks first the kingdom of God. And the most obvious fruit of that is a life where love leads. Love leads. Not even doing tons of stuff because the battle is for the heart. The first heart that must be one is ours. Then we can talk about other people's hearts. And the heart is not just, you know, do this instead of this. It, it is, what do you love? Who do you love? Why do you love there? And who are you? How do you understand yourself? And this is so powerful, brothers and sisters, this whole exchange here, because this exchange talks to every one of those things. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are you going? These are the questions that Jesus was pretty much asked by Satan. He knew the answers, and it wasn't because he studied the book late the night before to give the right answers. He was living from there. He was living from there. And that's our call. He was loving from there. How do you know? You're saying this. I'm going to make, I am now confronting the enemy. I know where it is. I know it's about my heart and the hearts of others. And the fruit is love. I'm fighting the way my master fights. And I am busy about my father's business, just like my master was. I know what that business is. I'm not guessing. I'm not filling in the blank. I know what it is because I know who he is. And he reveals this to me. So let's look at this briefly. And I can only make maybe one comment or so. <clears throat> As you see here, the, the name of this talk is How to Receive Worship, Serve Him Only. And that's said twice. And I wish I had planned that, but it's a mistake. <laughs> but let's say I like that now, so we'll keep it that way. That's the title so that you pay attention. How do you receive from the Lord? You receive from the Lord by being where the Lord is. Remember the word that we received, and I do think it was a word of the Lord. It was just, I think, last week that we heard it, that you sleep when the Lord sleeps, and you're awake when the Lord's awake. He was awake in the garden to be able to deal with the enemy. He was asleep in a storm to realize this enemy doesn't really have any power over me. This story is, okay, Jesus, I get this. The way you are and what you do, I'm supposed to be. We all have a desert and we have confrontations. And now Jesus wants us to win just the way he won. He's giving us this not to condemn us, but to give us an understanding how we win. Because you see, it's not just about us. It's about his kingdom, about the Father's will. He wants to teach us how to be about the Father and how to succeed. Okay, so we're going to back up here a little bit before we get into the temptation just a bit. We're going to look at Luke 3, 20 through 22. And then we're going to go to Luke 4. <clears throat> Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Uh, that one, forget. 21. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. So he was baptized, and it wasn't just an empty ritual. God was there. God spoke from the heaven. The Spirit of God anointed him as a king. The word anointing primarily comes from the anointing of a king. So Jesus now is anointed 
as the Son of God, in, as the Son of God. Son of God is the second person of the Trinity. Son of God now as the king on the earth. Remember, there's two understandings of the term Son of God. Kings were called sons of God. Jesus now is called the Son of God in the line of David. So he gets anointed as a king. And the Lord said, the Lord says, I like that. Jesus totally gives up his whole life. That's what baptism means, to be embraced by God according to his will. Do we understand that that's what your baptism means? You gave up your whole life. I know we can talk about how we only have one life, but the reality is, if we have to talk about it, we forgot about baptism. Baptism, which meant you don't have a life anymore. You only have one life. And the reality is, no matter how we think about it, there's only one life giver. So there's only one life. See what I'm saying? You may think there's such a thing as, a two, as two lives. Not really, only for the purpose of conversation, but when it's all over, there's just one life. There's just one life of the eternal one. There's not two. This is what makes us confused sometimes. They think, well, I can live my own life. Well, really you can't, unless it's his life. Jesus gives up his life to the Father, to be identified as the Son, Jesus of Nazareth. He's now the Son, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Brothers and sisters, we've got to restore the meaning of baptism. Because it happened a long time ago. It might have been a great experience at the time, or maybe not. Maybe you don't remember any experience. Sometimes we think it's faded. It marks you for your entire life and eternity. And that Jesus was marked for all eternity because of his submission to baptism. The reason that Christians are lethargic, they aren't clear that they have, if they've been baptized, that they have given themselves fully over to God. Their destiny is God's. Their future, their, what they're about is God's. And you know, they don't pick it. Everyone is called to represent Jesus. And then someone could say, yeah, represent Jesus as I do this. No, just represent Jesus, period. What you do and how that works out is secondary. The primary thing is that we're sons of God, and that's where our life comes from. So Jesus is baptized. That means... As we talked about before, he makes an oath before God, before the people around, and from now on, he's under service to his father. I can't get into specifics there, don't have the time. But now notice this, in the next chapter, and it's clear like in Mark, as soon as he was baptized, it said, he is led out into the wilderness by the Spirit. So what we might misunderstand here is some people think, okay, so now Jesus is going to have to be confronted by Satan. He's going to have to get this over with. He's going to have to swallow hard, and he's going to have to kind of get ready for this confrontation. Satan's, Satan's after him. He's got to face him first. He's got to gun him down before he can move on. That's really a distortion Jesus is after Satan. Jesus is going to make the confrontation. He's not waiting for Satan to come to him. He's going out to where Satan is, and that was understood to be in the desert. That is, where there is lifeless things, where there is death. That is symbolic, and there is some reality to that's where they believe demon spirits roamed in waterless places. So Jesus goes out into the wilderness because he knows he has to deal with him and he has been equipped for the confrontation in his baptism. He has already given up his life, what he would have been as a tremendous carpenter, what he would have been as a family man, what he would have been maybe even as a rabbi. He's given all that up because I'm loving God, I'm living his life, and you know what? That means I don't get to choose. Or rather, I do choose. I choose him. Because I love him. 
and he loves me. He says he's really pleased with me. I'm really pleased with him. So it's not, he's not going out like a commando. He's going out like a lover of God and a lover of all the people that God made. He's going to confront with this one who is the destroyer and the deceiver. And so, because of limits of time, we have to understand if you and I are taking our baptism seriously, what it means to be in Christ, we say we're disciples of Christ. But to be clear in our heart of hearts that we're living just for him. And it becomes obvious because we're going to pick a fight with anything that gets in the way of the love of God in our lives or his love in life on the earth. We're not going to stand back. There's no hiding. There's no closet we can go into. There's no island that we can try to seek refuge in because the whole earth has this dark layer over it that's predominated by the evil one. There's no way to hide, so you might as well confront him. And really, there's no sense to be afraid because we don't need not be afraid if we're close to the Father. The evil one should, should be afraid. We should never be, never, never be afraid. The people who are, are afraid aren't sure about their own hearts, but there, God has had it set up so that we would never be afraid. Right. We know the outcome of the confrontation. So that's why we're so bold. That's why we're so happy. That's why we have peace no matter the circumstances because we know he's well pleased with us and we are with him. But there's a confrontation and so we have to be orienting ourselves that way. The Lord, there's something inside of us, brothers and sisters, that God just wants to turn on. Right. Just make alive. And Understanding this, I haven't read the account. I'll, I'll read it just to end. <laughs> Seems like I have to. There's something about this account that if we understand it correctly, can help us turn on. See, let me use this analogy. It's a weak analogy. All analogies have problems, but this one, let me offer to you. If you understood what it meant to be a soldier, and you read some things or watch some movies, whatever, and then you say, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do night watch in my neighborhood, you know, because I'm gonna protect people that way and be able to 911 real quick and call up. That's some response. But a lot of what it means to be a soldier and that being activated is still dormant. If you say, oh, I'm gonna be an army reserve, you know, when, whenever I'm needed, you know, they can call me up. Probably you know a little bit more. Or but then, let's just say this, I am going to be enlisted into the army, and you know, I, I like it too, that they'll pay my college education. You know more. How about that you're in the army, you enlist, you don't really care about where, whatever the perks are, and you just say, I'm gonna be here, and I'm gonna be here for my whole life. You're gonna know a lot more. And then finally, I'm gonna be the whole life and I'm going to be in a situation where wherever the front line is, I'm going to go. You've got to know that if you su survive that front line experience, there's some things that you know that the guy in the neighborhood and neighborhood watch doesn't know. There's some things that are turned on about your understanding of what it means to be a soldier because of your orientation and because of where you've placed yourself and your general commitment to your whole life that someone could never know if they did not put themselves where that lifer on the front line was. Isn't that right? Yes. Huge difference. And you could tell the difference if you're in the present between one and the other. You just know by how they talk, how they act, maybe the shape that they're in. Right? It's just obvious. They're not giving a seminar about it. It just kind of comes <laughs> out by who they are. Our Christianity can't be of the spectator sort. We have to understand that we've given our whole lives to be on the front line to be able to advance the kingdom of God. And then we have to understand that's what worship looks like, that's what God wants on the earth because he loves the earth so much. He's looking for men and women who love him so he can love through them to manifest his love on the earth. And the way you do that is that you put yourself in a place and you orient your heart in such a way 
that you know that progressively you are being tested and passing the test about what love is because you are letting love lead your life. So the practical application, brothers and sisters, I mean, and again, this, this could be a series of weeks. But I just need to say this part so that you can make a connection. Having peace with your heart that you know nothing is before your allegiance to God and that you yourself have put yourself in a place that testifies you're all about letting love lead no matter where that takes you and it will take you to numbers of places where you will confront evil where you will see things that will test you but you're not going to give up because you know where life is there's no other life there's not another choice it's only an illusion about this middle way there is no middle way and you and I give ourselves to that then we can begin to hear about what it means to be a disciple and then we can be able to receive the presence of God and the power of God and the gifts of God as he would want to give to us because we're receiving him, his way for who he is. We're not just doing this to get things from him. We are receiving him for God, as God. So therefore, my whole life is all about you. And in that union, we are in a place to actualize, to make alive the blessings he wants us and he's provided for us to experience and to know. Brothers and sisters, so ask the Lord, where is your fight for love? Where is your heart regarding allegiance and worship him and serve him only? The Lord will help you as he will help me to move us to this place of certainty if you don't have it now. And with evidence, we'll say signs following, and I don't mean necessarily miracles. That means you'll have a certain kind of bearing and perspective on life that will just exude from you because that's where you've oriented yourself. This is the ultimate place of receiving being where he is, as he is, and giving up our life for true life and sharing in that life. Holy Spirit, I pray that you do this in us and among us. Lord, we, this is our desire. Please help us where we don't see this. Continue to work with our deeper self that we might continue to see what this is and that we might know that there's joy there and there's life there. And then this is who we are truly. Holy Spirit, I pray that you give us encouragement to be able to face this so that we could be activated by that spirit that lives within us. Holy Spirit, do this, I pray, for your glory in Jesus. Amen.